So, um, in this session we're going to split it into two. Um, to my right we have Nick Wilson, aka Mr. Beatnik, uh, records for a wonderful label, Do not be, Don't Be Afraid, and Graham Luckhurst, aka Grey Meta, Wolf Recordings. Give them a round, please. So in this session, we're going to kind of look at the kind of art of sampling, more like um, processes. You know, the, we all, as music producers, we're, we all utilize samplers, I guess, or sampling in our work. Yeah? Who doesn't? Okay, everybody. Nobody else good. All right, cool. But what's interesting, particularly in 2014, is that, you know, I'm, I'm assuming we all use either Logic or Ableton, Renoise, Cubase, or whatever. And we're all used to the fact that actually inbuilt is some kind of sampling. We can record easily. We can manipulate sound easily. So what this session is about is actually taking it back a bit and almost like, actually, at its heart, it's about audio manipulation. It's about not using presets. It's about not using standard libraries. It's about actually getting to nitty gritty and some of the process around what is so beautiful about recording and ma manipulating audio. So we're going to start off with Graham. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, so I... Um I'll get straight into it. I use Ableton a lot. Um, I tend to use it as a sketchpad for writing ideas, recording things in. I also use a lot of external bits and pieces, a lot of external hardware as well, but to write tracks and generate ideas, it's always, always on Ableton. And usually, all, usually on a setup like this, usually not in the studio. Um, so that's why I've got a MPK Mini, which is a very cheap, very nice controller that I use a lot. And it's a portable sound card, it's a Motu Ultralight 3 and a MacBook. And I use this setup a lot at home. I just find the environment at home or lounge or whatever a lot more, I suppose, a lot more relaxing to write in than the studio. I like to use the studio to finish things and, and, and add additional layers of hardware and, and, and program more MIDI in the studio. But in terms of using Ableton as a sketchbook, I like to use it in this setup. Um, I'm just going to run a track quickly. So this, um, this first one is I was going to use to demonstrate a technique that I use quite a lot, which is recording a live vocal session and then uh, resampling it. Let's see if we can get something out of here. You get I hope the, uh, the vocalist doesn't mind me playing this. So this is a raw vocal help take that I recorded. I won't play it all. But you get the idea. I'm it's a totally dry vocal. Soldier, baby, That's completely raw vocal. Um, and I had some beats and I resampled it over the top. Okay. It sounds a bit like this. I'll just play it quickly for you. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> don't worry, son, don't worry, son. <laughs> play this quick intro section. Uh, that's uh, essentially what I've done there is uh, a process of loops inside Ableton. So for taking that live recording and dropped it into straight inside Ableton. I really like the speed you can work out in here. Um, essentially, I've uh, transformed that vocal into all these clips here. Was the um, tempo of the um, a cappella a consideration? Um, no, it was different, I think. Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was actually written for a different track. That happens quite a lot. Okay. With, so uh, the fact that you can warp in Ableton has been really... Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I do use warping in Ableton on vocals quite a lot, mm -hmm. um, whether that is your cup of tea or not. I, I do like what it does. I like the way it processes it. And... Uh, I also like the way you can treat it once it's in the box. Um, it comes out sounding like... Not like that, ideally. Sorry, guys. So it comes out in clips like this. It, it, is, it is quite a primitive way of working with vocals, but I like the vibe you get. 
and that's where that chorus hook comes from. It's just chops into the vocal, so I use this technique quite a lot. And I just, yeah, I just like Ableton as a, uh, a very quick way to mm. manipulate samples in that respect. Um, do, you, do, you warp, um, do you use a warp marks at all when you're working with a... I uh, do, yeah. Can you, can you guys see the screen? You've got the screen. Yeah, you can see down the bottom here that it is, ma it is manipulated to a certain yeah. degree by stretching the pitch on there. Okay. Um, yeah, if, the, if it's slightly out or if I want to create, an, a, create a different swing on the vocal, mm -hmm. then you can use that very easily to, to do that. Um, so yeah, that's um, a very quick overview of sort of working with a live vocal take. I use a lot. Um, let me just bring up another one. I just like the speed of Ableton. I mean, there's a lot of conversations that go on. I think about the audio quality and, and all the rest of it. But sure. I mean, that's not you know doesn't really matter about that. And obviously, no. you can use there are different algorithms and uh, yeah, particularly the later ones in nine. Absolutely, yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different, the, the re-pitch and the complex, it allows you to get a very different sound out of the vocals in there. Uh, I also use Ableton quite a lot for dropping in samples and creating instruments out of a sample. Just to take a step back a bit, you used an uh, audio editor first before? Yeah, it's, yeah. that's just a, yeah. it's one I really, I find it incredibly quick, this one, it's called Fission, mm -hmm. um, just for chopping audio, mm -hmm. fading in and out, I prefer it to things like Audacity and, yeah. uh, and Logic okay. and things like that. It's just extremely lightweight, very mm. fast. And I use that before I go to Ableton a lot, so you can chop in and out. And, and, and so it's almost like a tape, tape, yeah. edit style. Yeah. yeah, it's very quick. You can literally highlight Fission. Yeah, f i double yeah. So you can literally yeah. highlight a section like that and uh, you just delete it. It's gone. And then you can export. You can export in native format, which is good as well. Yeah. So if you edit an MP3 or a WAV, stays as an MP3 or a WAV. You don't have to convert when you export. So again, yeah. it's... It's it's a, it's a nice way of working in that respect. Um, and also, I guess you have a different relationship with the piece of audio, don't you? In yeah. Working in that way. Yeah. When yeah. it's when it's outside of a, a, a DAW, I just think you think about it very differently. Mm -hmm. um, it enables you to pick sections, I think, yeah. a lot more, a lot more quickly and a lot more concisely. And if you've got it in a already inside a sequencer, you think I think you think differently about the audio. So I do use that a lot. Mm -hmm. I process it there, then into yeah. the DAW. So, yeah, I, I like that that aspect of it. It's just it's an incredibly quick way of doing it, I think, Vision. And this is another track that is forthcoming. So this is, uh, this is entirely comprised of samples, these sounds. They're not, they're not synths. And I like, this is back a stage from the actual release version. But this is where I was writing on it. So let's be clear about what a sample is. What is a sample? I will... The, um, on this track, the sample is that actual that main key line is a sample um i'll just run it quickly and then i'll i'll go into it so that main key line you hear there on the top is made up of a pad that i turned into an instrument yeah. um, it goes into this So there's a couple of things going on in this one. The, the drum group is composed of uh, this loop. I use this technique quite a lot as well, which is uh, overlaying hat layers that I, I like mm -hmm. over drum kits, basically. So you've got this yeah. over kicks. Yeah. And essentially, yeah, that, that's four layers of samples there. I use machine quite a lot for processing sounds, I really like that. That's and then drag, 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 dragging them over. Yeah, yep. mm -hmm. yeah it's that, that the, uh, the snare sound there is processed in machine. I really like the, the onboard processing machine. You've got um, MPC60 emulator inside machine and a SP1200 emulator in there as well with different filters. Again, it's, it's, uh, it's an in-the-box way of doing it. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very quick. Um, and I do write like this on trains and, and when I'm travelling around as well. So having that facility, is, it makes it very quick to work. So you're not actually checking your emails or no. Facebook updates? No. No. no, always working. Okay. Um, so that main piano line comes from here. So that actually comes from this section down the bottom. Is, which that, is, is that simply you're using? That is Ableton Sampler. Yeah, okay. Um, 
So I've created a patch on there by using an envelope filter on the sample. So usually it sounds like this. This is, I think, I can't remember where I got that from. I tend to sample from anywhere. I mean, I do have a lot of records and I do have a lot of CDs, but I sample pretty much anything I want. Yeah. Um, I know that's, well, you it's, just, perfect, it's totally down to opinion on that, but yeah. If, well, if, so uh, you're just capturing audio and you're, yeah. you're making your own. Yeah, sure. um, mm. I use everything. I use everything from my collection of records, CDs, through to sample packs, through to stuff I found on YouTube. I, I, I use anything, as long as it sounds. And I actually quite like the way some things sound when they've been on YouTube, believe it or not, that compression, and, and, and it just gives it a, it just gives it a very rough sound. It's uh, almost like vinyl, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't... <laughs> for uh, for sort of main main elements of the track, the, a lot of the kick drums and the elements that need to punch through, and I, I, would, I would not use versions I've found on YouTube, for example, <laughs> but um, I just, I'm, I'm not adverse to using sound from any source, sure. so yeah. it's... Um, yeah, I think that also comes from perhaps your heritage, you know, I think the fact yeah. that you've come from, you know, from vinyl, from sampling yeah. in, on, in hardware, I think. Yeah, yeah. M m musically, mm. I was not really ever into house music. Um, I make house in the sort of lo loosest possible sense, I suppose, now, but it was always jungle, hip-hop, yeah. sample-based music. Yeah. Um, so all of those sounds, and I listen to a, a, a lot of different music right across everything from sort of fusion, jazz, right the way through to African, mm -hmm. Brazilian rock and, and everything. So if there's an interesting sound and I find it somewhere and I want to use it, then yeah. I generally use it. But this is a technique I, I do like using, which is an envelope filter on the sample. So when I play it open like that, that's by opening up the decay, sorry, opening up the uh, sustain and release on that. But you can see if you pull down the envelope on here and re reduce the release. This makes it more uh, percussive, I guess. Yeah. Mm. So it's almost like creating a little instrument from the uh, from the patch. And, uh, I reuse a lot of these sounds. If I use it in this track, I might reuse it with a bit more reverb in a different track. So, I just really, uh, I think that's a, it's a good way to get individual, set, very sort of unique sounds. And I guess in terms of the um, the key of the key is not of interest for you when you're actually sampling it, is it? Is yeah, I mean the um, all samples will, will give you the ability to change the root note. Mm -hmm. So, you, I mean that's by ear really. I'm not, I don't have any musical training at all so that is finding the root note and making it work which is essentially it's transposing that chord mm -hmm. across the notes that you play so making that work making sure it works on the notes that you play is, uh, is something that I do entirely by ear mm -hmm. yeah sometimes it works sometimes it sounds rubbish but, um, just that's play that's around that's okay yeah yeah sometimes it is sometimes it isn't but yeah I, I just like the process of uh, being able to play around like that so that's uh yeah, it's a very useful technique, I think, for generating sounds that you wouldn't else wouldn't find on uh, on, on presets or on uh, on on synths. Um, and yeah, that's that's what I really wanted to illustrate on that one. We'll so I guess it's the next one. It's about, so you, the use of envelopes is something that should definitely be considered. Yeah, yeah and, and, and not take and not take a piece of audio at, uh, at face value, so to speak. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's they're long pads. Some of these samples are. You pull out a synth sound from a record, and you can turn that into something that sounds like a kit, like a uh, like a, a synth or, or a keyboard, which is very interesting. I like that. Um, so this is another one. This record's been out, and I just wanted to dem demonstrate transposing with this one. Um, a second. Something that Neville touched on earlier, actually, when he was talking about the chord lock on the on the Juno Six. Um, so that will take the same three notes and it will transpose that up or down the keyboard without actually... My music theory is not great, but it, it will move it up and down so yeah, you get that sure. ravey sort of pitched sound. Yeah. It's a straight transposition, um, which I used on here, on this key sound. So this is a C major Rhodes chord, straight transposed. That's that sound. So this key sound is uh, entirely made up of one pa one sound here. Again, it's it's I think it's a, a technique that allows you to get that if you if you're after that sort of transposed ravey sound, 
it's, it's a good way to do it. As long as you get your root notes right and you know, you know where you're starting from, then you can create some very nice melodies and you can switch it up. Look at the section. And again, using the envelopes here. Okay. So, so, so slowing the attack. Uh, yeah, that's slowing the attack, increase the release, and then maybe put some more. And would you consider, aut um, do you ever use automation? Absolutely, yeah. I use a lot of automation curves on the, on the bust reverbs. Mm -hmm. So these channels here, A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. I usually use a short reverb for drums, a long reverb for effects and synths, and then a, a delay. This I've got a PSP84 on here, which is an old one, but it's quite good on the short reverbs. Um, I like having the two sets of reverbs set up in the bus channels, just so you can l you can work literally like that on the fly. I mean, if I, if I wanted to record these in the beauty of Ableton, is you hit record and you can create these textures, which are. And that's all of the same. Yeah. That's all of that initial patch. Nice. So yeah, you can get some really nice stuff going, all from the noise and all. Yeah, mm. yeah, and I, I do leave that in. I like sure. I like the roughness. So yeah, I mean that's a, that, that's kind of the way I work. I, I really like the the attack decay, the stain release effects that you can you can work with on a sample. You can go a lot deeper into it. You can start to map cut off and and pitch onto the filters. Mm -hmm. Not something I'm, I'm particularly good at, to be honest, but um, it, it's something well worth investigating to get extra tones and extra effects on top. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's uh, I think Ableton is an extremely versatile in instrument for getting ideas going. Mm -hmm. I can get on a good day, I can get something up and running in 15, in 10, 15 minutes mm -hmm. using this technique. Sort of stock drum racks, uh, some samples that I have on the hard drive, wherever, wherever I source them from. Literally experimentation, drop them in, see what happens. If it's rubbish, bin it, yeah. twist it up, warp it up. Generally, within that sort of time frame, you're going to know if, if there's a bit of a vibe there. Mm. So, Can we have a bit more of the track, please? Yeah, sure, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Let's just reset that. Again, that was uh, that was a result of that same recording session from the from the first vocal. So from one vocal session, you got like ten tunes. I d yeah, I think it was about six or seven <laughs> tracks. Yeah, sure. so um, they're chopped, they're pitched. Um, uh, yeah, I just it, it's, if there's a little hook in there, I take it and use it. And um, as you can see on here, if I zoom in, a lot of these are quite primitive loops. So these sections here, that's all the same vocal layer pitched, yeah. um, and then pr obviously the production on the top of that is is. Uh, sort of defines the way it sounds in the mix. But um, yeah, it, 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 I work in quite a primitive way. That works, um, I mean, but that's okay, it's fine, yeah. you know. And I guess with, you know, Ableton gives, because it's a very flexible door, you know, you've got the opportunity to almost like, it's like a sound sound canvas in a way. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and, and having this sort of setup is it's just fantastic, I think. There's so much power in here. If you've got a hard drive full of samples as well, mm -hmm. a few drums, machine, or whatever you use for your drums on top of that, mm -hmm. just think it's, a, it's extremely, good way of generating ideas quickly yep. and uh, I don't think I'm going to be going back to the other sequences that I was using in the past having spent a good couple of years on this now I think it's it's great so Ableton can give me some free stuff now <laughs> <laughs> if you're in here hey <laughs> Mag magic happens um, any questions for you guys thoughts I 
yeah, it's 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 pretty it's quite primitive. Essentially, it's the same clip pitched, but it's pitched within key. So you're essentially making a chord out of the pitched vocals. So if you're taking it down seven tones or, f or five tones or whatever works within that chord or key you're working in, and then it's the production on that. Sometimes I, e I EQ it quite heavily, compress it. Um, but it's essentially, it's the same clip twice. Um, um, duplicated. Duplicated. So down here, we've got, uh, you've actually got two of the same thing running here. You've got that, and then that. That's like. So that's that's two of the same thing playing at the same time in here, but pitched against each other. I know it's a uh, it's a technique that's been used a lot in a lot of records recently, um, but it works. I, I, yeah, it is, it's 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 a sound I like, and uh, yeah, it's as simple as that. It's just double tracks. Um, pitched in, so you're essentially creating a chord out of the samples. And is there an advantage to working in the arrange page as opposed to working with MIDI? I you, you, I actually start in this view. I start in clip view. Yeah. Um, so I tend to have a basic drum track going up here. Mm -hmm. It's all very badly labelled. Uh, this and then this is a vocal group here. So there's the different clips that I literally sit there and let's see if we can get them going piece by piece. Oh. Yeah, I mean, these, this is, so this is where they come from. That's the original vocal. So that's created, essentially created a palette of sounds there. Um, a lot of the time I just push record and push and go. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of the time I just uh, I push record and run the clips if it's off a controller or, or an APC or, a no or one of the launch pads, Novation use, they're really, really good for this sort of thing. I've just pushed record, literally hit it, drums, and then Vibes. the rest of it is jammed. Mm -hmm. And then I go into that view and edit. Yeah. So a lot of the recordings are live take into that. Capture performance yeah. and edit. Yeah, sure, yeah. we're fine. Cool. Yeah. cool, any other questions? Cool, all right, Mes go for it. Yeah. I use Ableton. I, yeah. I, I use. Once, it, once it's in this form, then Ableton is amazing for MIDI controlling, I think. So I use any external synths, are all going to be triggered via MIDI through here. Um, it's extremely quick. I think I've got four or five bits of analog gear and external sort of digital drum machines and bits and pieces. So once it's in this format, Sometimes I replace the drums. If I've got a lead, if I've got a synth, I think I'm using a, a VST bass synth in here. Um, so I take the MIDI from that, reroute it out, something like a 1080 or a Mini Brute to give it a, a lot more punch. But at this stage, it's yeah, it's sketched in the book, but it allows you to go as far as you want from there, which is another very good thing. It's very quick to do external MIDI, MIDI triggering via Ableton. Do you tend to work, um, obviously, in terms of the vocal, I quite like the fact that you've got this one vocal session and you kind of rinse it. Yeah. I quite like that approach. Yeah. So do you, um, do you do the same kind of things with your drums or loops or breaks or whatever, create? I, I haven't recorded many drums, actually. Okay. A, lot of them are, a lot of them are from records. Mm -hmm. um, but you tend to use them, you know, reuse the yes. same, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. When, when, they're, when they're processed and when they're chopped into drum racks, mm. um, again, it's something that Neville was saying earlier about having stock drum racks. Um, just load them into another track or or reopen an old track, delete everything, and then make a new track using the old track, yep. which is great because then you you have that sound um on a on a blank template in Ableton, I just use I start from scratch every time I have nothing. The only thing I have is these three sends on the end that are the same as um, opposed to two yeah. yeah because you're, you're different like <laughs> <laughs> that's it that, so I start from that every time. Um, so that's a drum reverb, a long reverb, and a, and a, and a miscellaneous third sure. return that I can put something into. And, but yeah, I mean, re reusing tracks is, is great. Another thing that Ableton does very well is allow you to drop tracks into other tracks, yeah. 
which is something I only found out about fairly recently. So if you've got half, a, if you've got a sketch or something you don't think is very good, and you've got a couple of sketches and throw them all into the same pot. So you can go from one, one arrangement in another track rather than having to open it and copy and yeah. paste, you can literally go into the browser. You, and yeah, you can drag the actual Ableton file mm -hmm. in as long as you've got enough tra um, channels available. Mm -hmm. You can drag it in, and then you've, you've essentially you combine two tracks immediately. and You put another one in. So I sometimes have I like the drums on that track. Mm -hmm. Well, this is this is a track I've written. Uh, the rest of it's rubbish, but I like the drums. So I delete everything else, save it as a, a drum channel. Mm -hmm or save it as a synth channel, or save it as a, another channel, and then you can go tr 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 yeah. three, four into the Obviously, same. being Ableton, it, it obviously maps the tempo of yeah. the old arrangement to the new ones. Absolutely, which is yeah. fantastic and really flexible. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Any other pressing questions before we segue into Nick? Go for it. Um, it is kind of organised into that. You can see that. There's all sorts of stuff in there I've found. Some are, there's a few sample packs in there. There's, there's a few other drums. A lot, there's a lot of stuff I've recorded in here. Um, and then I have a couple of external drives as well of vinyl I've ripped or found sounds. Just I have yeah, a couple of external drives. And then the bulk of it is on here because this is the machine I have with me most of the time. So if I can get things going on here and if I have some other time, I can, I can dip into the other libraries. Cool. Go for it. Mm. Do you find when you've got like writer's block that you will spend a lot of time just going through and just making loads of samples, getting loads of pieces down, and then when you're ready to create, that's when you will start dragging everything out? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've, I've have done, I have had periods where I broke my arm last summer and uh, I couldn't do anything, so I spent three weeks chopping up CDs and vinyl and everything I downloaded, and I ended up with three or four gigs of snippets sort of two, three seconds long. So you got a massive library of sound that I generated just using Fission, literally chopping it up for two weeks solid. And that sort of library is, is just incredibly valuable. And then it's here, I've got it all the time. It's totally unique. No one's got that. Mm. Sorry, say that again? Uh, sort of like having three years created work, yeah. 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 Um it, and it's, it's something you can do if you've got half an hour or so. You just go through whatever you've got, records, CDs, MP3s, just cut them up, create your own banks of samples, and no one else is going to have those. You can download as much as you like, but other people are going to have it. If you create your own custom sample banks, you're, you're on to a winner. And that's, that's kind of, you, you've created your own sound already before you've even taken it into, into the sequencing or the sampling stage. You've already got this bank of, right, I've chosen these, no one else has chosen these, so... But what's interesting, I guess, um, you know, for a generation who are brought, brought up with, you know, sample banks, um, hmm. and also <coughs> sample banks what, what aren't what they were in the early 90s, or, you know, where they sounded very weak, actually, modern yeah. sound libraries are brilliant. So, yeah. do you yeah. have to spend a little bit of time um, refining the samples that you've made um, before you import them into Ableton, or do you work on the, or do you know you have to work on them? Within Ableton, the ones the ones that I've collected myself, generally I'll leave the, leave them as is, and there's always something. Um, as far as sample packs as you can get on the internet, I, they, I mean they're good, but other people are going to have them. So sometimes for I mean for drum sounds, for stock drum sounds, you can't really go wrong. I mean you can for character you can take them from other places, but if you really want a, a kick or something that hits hard and you're using samples. Why not use a kick that you like? Sure. That's already been engineered to sound really big. I mean, you can always replace it with a, a drum, machi drum yeah. machine in the studio. Yeah. But or layer it or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But a, a, something like an 808 under like a, a woody drum kick that you found on a, on a record somewhere, and you can press that together, sometimes that's going to give it a very unique character. Sure. But then it's not trap, you know. So no, exactly. <laughs> Joking. No. But yeah, I mean, it's, it, yeah, if you, you, can, you can download stuff all day, but... Mm -hmm. Other people are going to have it. So. Sure. Um, and this song, I'll also, also ask you, Nick, in a second. Do you think, you know, <clears throat> there's too much? You know, what well, I mean, you know, obviously we've got, you know, gigs and terabytes and terabytes yeah. of you know, space. You know, we've got, you know, space is never, an, an, not an issue anymore. Whereas obviously there was a time when it was. I yeah, mean, I mean, what's, I, your, what's your approach to that? I think sometimes it's a hindrance. Um, the last album I wrote off about 40 samples, I think. Very, very small clips. The fact that I had access to it's almost irrelevant that you've got this much stuff. You might as well not have it. Sure. You've got, it's like listening to music. Mm. Unless you're going to actually spend some time with something, you might as well not even bother listening to it. It's, it's that level of access. You've got to 
sort of carve your own path and find the things that work for you and, and, and give you the sound that you want. Or mm -hmm. sure. Rather than getting right off lock because I've got three million kicks yeah. given free. Yeah, sure. yeah, having less is, is, is absolutely absolutely more. And the same with VSTs as well on a production level. Don't have 150, 200, 300 VSTs. Mm. Delete the ones you don't use after, after a year or so of experimenting. If a new one comes out, yeah, great, great grab it. But um, if you're not going to use it, I've had hundreds and hundreds of VSTs over the year. Mm -hmm. Probably only use ten mm -hmm. now out of everything that's out there. Yeah. And the same with the sound libraries. Just, just got to filter it down. Sure. Sure. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Any more? At the back there, then you. You might have to shout, mate. Do you have any tips for sample processing? Sample processing, it, yeah. It's, um, I don't do a lot of it, but I've worked with people who do a lot of it. I think it's probably something that Nick will cover and have more uh, more idea of. But there's there's guys out there like Mum Dance, for example, who's been doing some extremely interesting stuff recently, which revolves around the way he processes sound. So if you listen to some of his records and, and older bits of... Older, older hardware, if you're processing drums using older hardware, you're going to get a different sound as if you're processing something within Ableton. You're probably going to get a better sound, a crunchier sound. Or the old emu samplers, they're going to, you're going to get a totally different sound. So it's, it's, it's almost part of the creative process choosing a sampler to work with because it will give you that snap or, it will, or you'll be able to pitch it. So it's, it's, it is, again, it's a... I mean, I could just like pick up from yeah, 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 everything you're yeah, saying, yeah. answer that question and talk about, you know, obviously Graham's showing you the modern way of working now where you've got a million different options mm. all, in, all in the box. Um, with Ableton you can do just about everything. Personally, I cannot use this at all. <laughs> you know, I'm sure like many of you, I look at it and I'm just completely bamboozled by all the little buttons and there's a menu behind another menu, you have to drag a drop down to edit something. I just can't work like that. So, for me, I just, um, I mean, this is I guess pretty primitive by right. modern technology terms. Um, you've got a sampler here. I think this the total amount of memory on this is 12 megabytes. Cool. So, so I haven't even got expanded <coughs> memory here. So why don't we take a step back? Yeah. And so what do you have on the table here? This is the MPC. Does anyone know what an MPC is? Yeah. Oh, who doesn't know what an MPC <laughs> is? Let's just be I'm clear. I'm kidding. About you know what one of these is. <laughs> you never know. There's always one. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> um, and. As you can see, this is also some pretty hilarious technology these days. This is a zip drive, which uses zip disks. And it's connected via? Connected via SCSI. What's SCSI? SCSI, I don't know what it means. <laughs> um, but the amount of memory that you get on one disk in here is 100 megabytes. So I guess your phone's probably got about 20,000 of those. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, to compare. Yeah, uh, yeah so anyway, um, and yeah, so it's got 12 megabytes, which probably doesn't sound very much by today's standards, but um, you know, it's actually a lot of memory to be able to make a, a sample program like what I've got on here. So this is a custom drum kit that I've made. Um, again, going back to what Graham was saying about sample libraries and using sample libraries, I've always hated that, never ever used them, always made my own individual drum kits, drum samples, sample programs. It's very, very time consuming. In, in the time that it would take him to make a track, I'd probably have done half a snare. Sure. But then that's um, also, or yeah. But that, maybe a bit of a hi hat. But that's also, you know, pre, pre, you know, laptop, pre having lots of, um, you know, hard drive um, space. That was part of the process. Yeah. You know, can you actually take Actually, yeah. it's a fun part of yeah, the process. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. You know, in like nowadays, everyone just seems to be wanting to be able to make a track really quickly and have it all down and it's mixed and it's compressed. You know, sometimes like, I know if you want to rake the same gravel of sampling, it's a lot more fun to just sit there and go, listen to a thousand jazz records and go, wow, that hi hat man. Sure. <laughs> I've never heard one like it. That is going in my sample sure, library. Of course. You know, mm. it's just a really different way of working. So, of here's my here's one of my libra libraries, um, one of my programs, I should say. So this one's just kind of got a lot of generic stuff you recognise, like I don't know, that's a CR8000 hi hat or something. Sounds like a CR8000 Tom. Yeah, another one. Some chord off something. S some chord off something. Good. Wood block. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have one wood block. You got, you got <laughs> Always one wood, blo wood block. Oh, another hi hat. Good, good clap there. <laughs> Sounds like a DMX drum machine. 
Oh, a good zap there. Always need one zap. <laughs> nice bit of noise. Good kick. And then what's the point of having this? Well, you never know quite what you're going to need. Because sure. when you've got the arrangement up, when you've got, you might have something that you're building a track around, and this might be your sketch pad that you're working off. Mm -hmm. You don't know whether you're going to need the really, really massive kick that goes, or if you're going to need a really light one that's very high. Because you might have a really massive bass line, and if you put the massive kick under that, mm -hmm. it will just sound horrible. It will it'll clip and just distort. Whereas the little light kick is going to sit cut lovely sure. and nicely on top. So again, it's like it's about considering what you've got in in the mix and in terms of the the frequencies in the mix. Mm -hmm. You know, the frequency range, as we most people might know, if you don't know, that's this is how it works. You kind of got like frequencies all the way down from about thirty hertz mm -hmm. all the way through to about twenty twenty k twenty thousand hertz at the top. And your job as a producer is to try and put sounds all the way through that frequency spectrum that are going to sit. They're not going to clash. They're going to harmonize and they're going to help each other so that when the track plays through a speaker, the speaker's not going to go crazy, you know? You put two kicks that are really massive on top of each other, that you, you, the, the woofer's just going to blow straight away. You know, if, you've, if you haven't got a perfect balance of frequencies all the way through, it's going to sound, you know, not quite right. So this is why the, the idea is to try and, you know, put kits together that, that kind of help you, guide you through that process. And you think like, oh, I've got space there. You know, mm. where's my wood block? Are you also mindful of this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, zap, zap, actually. <laughs> yeah, I need a zap for that. With so, zap. are you also mindful of, uh, you know, kind of frequency differentiation while you're sampling as well? I guess so, yeah. Mm. But I wouldn't, uh, there's not really any kind of clever process behind it. Apart from having a cup of tea or a spliff and just. Well, yeah, definitely not a spliff. <laughs> okay. We've got young people here, but a cup of tea. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you do. True. Very large cup of tea. <laughs> Um, yeah, so maybe I can demonstrate how this actually works. So in the MPC, it's really, really um, long-winded to program things. What I try and do is program things on different tracks, and also I um, set a master tempo. So here we've got like 120, and that's the metronome. Now, this is pretty important. You've heard about quantizing, quantizing and not quantizing. I would always say, wherever you can, try not to quantize because it's just going to sound a lot better. It's going to a lot more of your human feel is going to be in the track. So let's use a bit of quantize and make something really average. Now, it's cool. It sounds pretty good, but it doesn't really have much motion, much movement to it. We could, we could put a clap in there. And you know, yeah, quite conceivably, we could at this point detail all over the world. M maybe, maybe, make, maybe make thousands of pounds. Um, we're already better than David Guetta, all right, at this point. A lot better than David Guetta, but that's not what we're going for we're trying to do something a bit more original. So what I try and do then is two, three, four, and put the first kick on the first bar is quantized. And then if this down button, sorry, my down button's really sticky from all the T. <laughs> so this will probably go horribly wrong because my timing will be really off, but if we can try and get some live kicks to match with that. Three, four. And already it's just sounding a little bit better, you know? When I mean, the pattern's a little bit more interesting than straightforward, right? So, so like that human swing. Yeah. That was terrible. And fortunately, we have an undo sequence button here. <laughs> oh, I've lost everything now. No, we can't do that. 
Right, let's just start over. It was bad anyway. <laughs> Now that's why I said at the beginning, always use a different track. Because that way, if I got that bit right, mm -hmm. but then I then fucked up this bit, mm -hmm. I can still go back, which sure. I can do now. So I guess, um, so in terms of the way the, M the MPC works, can you talk a little bit about the, how the sequencer works? Because you've got a sequence, mm. and within the sequence you've got tracks, okay? Just as you would in any in a door. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> yeah, so, I mean, really, it's, it's just a, a MIDI sequencer. Um, there's not too much complexity to it. What I'm kind of doing is layering different patterns of MIDI programming on top of each other. Yeah, so that's what, that's what a track is in an MPC. Where's the wood block? Time for the wood block. All right, cowbell. Better. More cowbell. Now, um, I thought I'd demonstrate a bit. Graham was talking about um, some of the pitching um, of chords, chopping a chord and using it to do like a kind of rave melody. And you can do that in the MPC as well. So what we need to do is uh, switch on, what was it called again? 16 levels, there we go. Turn on, oh that's velocity, I don't want that. Uh, variation there. Yeah. This point, we're starting to have a little bit too many sequences and things, so I think we need to start a fresh one. Um, sequence three, track two. I mean, essentially, you know, using hardware, you know, there's the sense that it's a lot more tactile, a lot more kind of like, I guess you're talking, there's an exchange which that you don't have necessarily with having, you know, using a laptop or using... Yeah, yeah? and as you is can see, I can't have a conversation and do it at the same well, time. <laughs> Isn't it terrible? Well, this is what you know, <laughs> I was trying to get Use that. this. This is much <laughs> more practical, you know. No. <laughs> and, it, and it's just like you're always going, oh, wh where's the menu to do that? Yeah. Oh, God. Well, but, but and then, I've had it since 1997, <laughs> and we're go. still not anywhere. Some, something's not changed. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this but, is a really yeah, good advertisement sure. for why this is better. Um, but it's interesting. No, it's, well, and it's interesting because you know I think again, what you know, just again looking at, I'm you know, I haven't used an MPC in a while. But what's actually quite beautiful is the fact that you have to stop. Do you know what I mean? You do a mm. sequence, you have to stop, and then something. It's almost like a recalibration. You know, even if like you're, you're right in a groove, the fact you have to stop to do another process mentally, you're kind of processing what you've just done. Do you know what I mean? So rather than the, you know the opportunity. I think so. Yeah. And I think also like. It's just so rewarding. Like, there's something about the sound. You know, the gentleman at the back was asking about processing and how do you process. Well, every time you sample something, you are already processing something. Sure. Mm. And I think the main difference between the hardware and the software in this respect is that because of the way that these sound cards are in these modern devices, you're, it's almost like taking a digital photograph. Mm. You, um, you're taking a perfect... Imagine you've got like a 25 mega megapixel camera or whatever, and you're taking a photo of a sunset. You're going to see every little detail in there. Mm. With, the, with the older hardware, because of the way the A to Ds are, that you're not really getting that photo. It's a bit like, I don't know, a Nokia or something sure. trying to take a picture. Well, there's, a, there's an analog process before. The, you know, the analog process is different on older hardware compared to using, say, a modern you know, audio interface. You because know. you're going analog to digital, yeah, sure. that's what's happening. The A to Ds are what you're hearing in the machine and it's the same reason, I don't just use the 2000, I use the SP1200 synthesizer, uh, sampler, sorry, and the, um, what's the other thing? Oh yeah, the S950, which never was shown before. All of those, I mean, they're all kind of roughly within the same t period. Some of yeah. them are 12-bit, some are 16-bit, but they all have different A to D converters. different grain. Sure. And mm -hmm. when you start layering, you know, if you've got like, let's say, drums on the SP12, hi-hats on the 2000, you filter a sample with the S950 because the loop sampling when it's really good and the filter is like a 12, 
12 dB low pass filter, which is really rich sounding. By the time you've layered those three on top of each other, you've got something that sounds really nice to listen to. Like, oh, I was just going to try and try and get our little groove down with it. There we go. Get the idea. You can do that. Uh, I was going to kind of show a bit more of a working <coughs> example. This is something. Yeah, while you're not multitasking, yeah, um, cool. I'll, um, has anybody got any initial MPC questions right about now? Cool, gentleman in front. Mm. 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 You can do. You can do, but to be honest, like that just sounds like work, you know. It sounds like really people really trying to care about, like, oh, you know, when it's in the box, then I'll be able to adjust the hi hat. I don't really mind. I'd rather just just take. I haven't even got the eight out um, box, which you might be able to see. I just go stereo out, um, and I just I just like the way it sounds on the output. And then from that point on, yeah, then you're talking signal path and processing again. Once you've done your initial sampling, then you're going into the computer. What happens between inside here and the computer is important. And at that stage, yeah, I'm going into a desk. I'm going through some, you know, probably a touch of like valve compression, a um, bit of EQ off the desk, probably some bucket brigade hardware like um, delays and reverbs and things like that. Just anything to, s and all of those uh, changes add character, add noise, add distortion. So by the time you're in the computer, you it's already sounding quite good. And then when I'm inside the box, I probably won't do that much just because I don't really like the sound of digital EQs. I find them too, I find they ring uh, in the kind of a very precise way. Like they're only really good in my view for just notching things. If you've got a really horrible frequency in a sample, you know, like a really resonant kind of tom or something, you can just notch that out. Um, Here's another example. So here, this is um, some something off a new track I'm working on at the moment, and you can kind of hear. So I spent a long time chopping these strings up. That's uh, that's not multi pitch. That's basically the same sample, but. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. And it's similar to like how, you know, if you know the way Jungle Records sound with that old breakbeat kind of backing, I always really liked that. And that's how I started programming drums was chopping loops up, um, cutting them to end to end and then making sequences out of them. Mm -hmm. And it, when you chop loops and then assign them on pads on something like this, you can always, you know, you, let's say you can chop one on the kick and chop another on the snare. Yeah. And that enables you to, to trigger and create different patterns. So I do the same thing with um, melodic samples, like like this string part here. Yeah. It's like a hip-hop aesthetic, I guess. Yeah. It is, yeah. I mean, we could just make a hip-hop beat right now in 10 seconds with that. Um, on a little bit of a RAPJD kick. Sorry about this. It takes me like at least 20 seconds to change the tempo. <laughs> there we go. Three, four, one, two, three, four. Hip hop. Where's, where's, the <laughs> where, where's the boom bap? Where's the snare? Oh, I don't think I've got a snare on this program. Ah. We, could, we could bring one in from my other program, but that will take us. We'll be, we'll be out of time. <laughs> cool. Questions, people? Go for it. Do I use the digital versions there? IMPC. Oh, the iPad, but, um, like the iPhone. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, but. I don't know about you, but I find hitting the screen like this just really 
it looks stupid and it feels stupid and I can't seem to get anything in time. It's a cool idea. I've always thought like handheld NPC that big would be the best thing. Um, I've so seen you'd the need 16 phones, wouldn't you? Yeah, exactly. So, no, that'd be great. <laughs> Phone man. Um, they do they do a new one, don't they? There's a little one, and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, NPC fly. Yeah. Mm. That's, yeah that was, that was pretty good. Yeah. Cool. Nice one. Go for it. Oh man. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, eBay, uh, but it, they are. There's actually a kind of a, 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 a sort of black market for them now. <laughs> um, Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, you could maybe join. We have a kind of, me and my friends have a, a little sort of secret Facebook group um, that they won't allow me to talk about, so I've just got myself in trouble. And it's <laughs> full of um, producers who need things like zip disks and special wires. And so there's a lot of, I've got 20 zip disks, what, what have you got to swap, you know? And uh, yeah, it goes pretty deep. You know? I've got these <laughs> Polaroid films. Ooh, <laughs> good swap there. <laughs> cool. All right. Good question. I think just mood. Um, all the best samples have just got a really nice mood. Like you heard that, those, that sort of string sound there kind of had a really nice atmosphere to it. Um, I'm not really bothered about what key it's in. I can always change that afterwards. I, I've been a bit facetious about the computer stuff. I do use it. I do use Ableton sometimes just to, you know, when you've got a, a loop that's just too BPM too long to fit in the arrangement, I'll probably just go in and... Sure. It just makes life easier. But, but then um, also, you know, using something like Machine is a really good yeah. um, middle ground, you know, because you can use it in a very kind of like, you know, simple way mm. and with your, as in MPC, but it also can go to town. With it. But yeah, that's another story. But I think mood thing is very important. And mm. I think particularly with a lot of your music, mood is fundamental, isn't it? Because a lot of your tracks, bar the drums and the bass or whatever, there's always a kind of feature, moody string thing, isn't there? I think that's it. I like... I, you know, the sort of stuff I used to like listening to and I was always crate digging for, you know, I always like those kind of really dark jazz sounding hip hop beats yep. by, I don't know, Buck Wild um, and, and things like that. You know, all the people that used to chop up David Axelrod samples, all of those UK library, KPM, um, Bruton, um, yeah, Brian Bennett mm -hmm. type stuff, Alan Hawkshaw. That's really what I like. I like that kind of drama mood and UK library feeling. So I will tend to go for, you know, those kind of samples. Yeah. Roots and hip hop and all that. Cool, go for it. Yep. Yeah, it's really as simple as that. Yeah. Um, the editing on this is a real pain. So, what I have managed to find, or I have kind of got my 2014 workaround for that, um, where I've got a USB floppy uh, drive, which works on the Mac. So, and then I've got this program on the Mac that can you can create the programs for this. So you can assign um, inside the software mm -hmm. pad to note. And that does shave like half an hour off the three hour process. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I will. Okay, with that. That's, that's really helpful. Um, obviously though, if you're using the computer to do the sampling, that's gonna change the way that it sounds. Um, really, the, using the A to D on the 2000 is important because it, it has a really good capture like really nice quality of capture. <laughs> oh, the drum machine will go straight into there. Yeah, just straight in. Or maybe through the desk to if I wanted to add a bit of noise or something. Okay, for Never done that, but I know Danny Brakes um, has his whole studio wired up to his 2000 and just uses that in the same way someone else would use Cubase or something. And he's got rack mount um, emus and modular synths and stuff, and literally everything is triggered from here. That's what they say, yeah. People say that the sequencer in it is, is just the media out is very, very sharp, really on it. So, yeah, that's one way of working if you can be bothered to set up that kind of you know, um, X-Men style brain control center <laughs> where the entire room is running off just the NPC. <laughs> the mothership. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Go for it. Um, oh, uh, yeah, that's embarrassing. That shows you how long I've had this, so there you go. <laughs> I 
I think everyone kind of is different. The little anecdotal stuff I know about the way that Diller happened to make beats, that f that trick of the first kick quantized and then the rest live is actually a Diller trick originally. Um, I think he just had a very, very good sense of manual timing. If you know the Slum Village Volume 2 album, the um, all of the beats for that were originally something completely different. And he actually got T3 and the guys to rap over the MPC kick, um, click and then rewrote the music to the words, which seems really the backwards way of working. But yeah, I think he, you know, if, especially if you kind of know a few things that he flipped, a few of the samples that he used, uh, he was very, very clever at, you know, he, he was sort of like on an astrophysics level of MPC programming. So yeah, look up to him in that, in that sense, definitely. Cool. All right, anyone else? Cool, wanna hear more music? Yeah. Cool, all right. We're gonna have a bit of a battle now. <laughs> no, <laughs> I know. I know. We look like we're about to play World of Warcraft online, but this is this is unfair. So I can't put you both on the spot, no. <laughs> no, I'm done joking. No, it's interesting. I mean, there are all different approaches, and I think um, you know maybe if we do this again, which we should, I think we should have maybe an MP, you know a machine out here or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what's clear is obviously there's a very ta there's a tactileness to using hardware. There's a kind of almost like beautifully simplistic way of working that's very focused, and there's obviously this kind of you know A, a to D debate, mm. you know, which will always rage. Because I think personally, have you, have you used the um, filters um, on? Well, first of all, have you owned an MPC in the past? No, I've not no. used MPC. I use a lot of the groove templates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the MPC, on Ableton, because when you're programming MIDI, there's a lot of groove templates. Arguably, I don't know, you'd need to A B them. I think. Yeah. But there's a lot of extremely good swing settings and groove templates within Ableton. Um, the swing on machine I really like. Um, again, as, as I said, sometimes I, I generally use Ableton for ideas generation. If I'm if I'm going into the studio, I do use mostly hardware. The Roland TR8 was mentioned earlier. That's a really nice bit of gear. Um, the shuffle function on that is what it's called. Gives it that swing and that groove. Um, I mean, another technique I use on Ableton is this thing down the bottom, which is manual track delay. Yeah. So you can record in and quantize it, but then you can so give push it, it push 15 it milliseconds again. in or out off the, off the groove. So you want to push the clap back, then use, I use the track delay, or sometimes I use a groove template. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's, there's, yeah, there's definitely different ways. But you, I mean, you can't beat the things like the MPC60 for swing and, and the MPC2000, those those stock groove templates there. Yeah. There's like an immediacy to, you know, you know there's obviously a you know, if you really want to get geeky, you know, there was this big debate between this, the timing of the MPC-60, yeah. which was the Roger Lynn yeah. MPC-60 yeah. compared to the post-Roger Lynn generation. So if you really want to go there, you can yeah. go there. But ultimately, you know, it's, I think it's about training your ears and what kind of sound you want. I mean, clearly for both of you guys, groove is important and how you approach groove whether it's just having one quantized kick and the rest is feel, or whether you use groove delays, kind of up to you, isn't it? And I guess that's the that's the t test of it. Yeah. And more importantly, to find your own groove. You know, yeah. I think we can all we can all get lost in trying to compare our groove to a groove that we like, whether it's a Theo or Moody Man or Dilla groove. But yeah. ultimately, just find your own, right? I think that's it. Yeah. I mean, you know, don't look at these. I think, unfortunately, with the culture around um, music tuition and and in the sense of like trying to teach people to make electronic music, there's a lot of emphasis placed on I don't know computer music mag where they show you how you can make like a Neville Watson track imitation yeah. from scratch. What we should be learning from watching Neville with his equipment there is like the guy's got his own style, his own feel, his own groove. Um, you should be going out there and trying to think. Well, if that's how everyone else does it, how can I do it differently? Sure. But his money's been made there, so that's a whole other conversation. Oh, yeah, not to sure. hate. Yeah, of course. Everyone's got to put money in it. Of course they do. The of course, I know. And, you know, and also, <laughs> and also people are willing to learn, right? So it's fine. Yeah. You know, I think. But I'm just saying we yeah. should be teaching the right things, and that is, you know, find your own way to do things. Yeah. Make sounds that are unique to you. Mm -hmm. cool. There is, um, just very quickly on that, there is another feature that I have used quite heavily in the past and on Ableton. A lot of DAWs, DAWs do it, is creating groove templates mm -hmm. from a sample. So you can take a you know, take a samba loop or an afro break, yeah. and you can actually create a groove template from that. So again, I have I don't have that many, probably five or six, a mm -hmm. um, couple of uh, from Brazilian records where you get heavy swing. Mm -hmm. You've got that heavy sort of samba shuffle or, or a batacada drum, and you can create your own groove template from that, and then map the MIDI onto that. Mm -hmm. So if you're using a drum machine, then you can 
play the drums in. Mm -hmm. You can play them in straight, you can play them in quantized, and then you can map them to a manual groove template. And that's something that's, I mean, that's, it sounds out of this world if you get it right. It's, sure, it's incredible. And that is another thing, you can collect your own groove templates or, yeah. It's, uh, so to take it st a step back to, um, to the whole kind of philosophy around sampling, I mean, is yeah. there something that you both, kind of, is there kind of a rule or kind of set of rules, a kind of silent manifesto you have to to actually building your sample libraries and sample collections before you actually get into the production process. I, I just I think if it if it excites me and I haven't heard it before, it either fits within in, into the remit that I have, I suppose, sonically and uh, in terms of the way I write, or I've never heard anything like it. So generally, sort of two, one that I know I could use, and one I'm like, oh, where's that? Where's that come from? Sure. Okay. And Nick, apart from moodiness. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just looking for function. Like I said, you know, the frequency spectrum and all that boring stuff, you know, if it feels like it's, it could be a good tool in the kit, mm -hmm. it definitely goes in there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yeah, it's all about sounds that are a bit inspiring and fun to play with. Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't just have a whole kit of generic 808, 909 sounds on, sure. on here. That wouldn't do anything for me. And can you both share a kind of, um, you know, some put you on your spot, can you share, share like a significant sample find moment? Probably when I found the oh, can I do my plug actually? <laughs> Hi everyone. There you go. Yeah, the, when I found the uh, the sample for the first track on here, the Synthetes trilogy, which is available now in all good stores and on iTunes. There's two copies here if anyone wants one. Because um, I'm trying to get rid of them, no one's buying it. Um, yeah, like I think when I found the strings for the, the Synthetes, that was um, yeah quite major. Just you know, in the record shop and just like oh man, that's, that's it. That's Sorted. A find. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. See you at Sonar. And it's a find. <laughs> it's a find. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sure, man. Yeah, probably. Uh, Graham? In terms of, I don't know if I can answer that in a particularly interesting way. I suppose rhythms have always been my number one. And a lot of, I, I listen to a lot of Brazilian music, a hell of a lot of Brazilian music. And some of the records that I've found when I've been out there, just out of this world. Mm -hmm. um, and massively inspirational in terms of grooves and, and uh and, and, and what you can get out of drums, really. And are you, are you working those samples into the Wolf more? I use the groove the templates. Yeah. Okay. So I actually use the grooves from the, the, the a lot of the records I've found mm -hmm. to create electronic music. Okay, cool. Yeah, which is, yeah, I mean, sometimes, again, sometimes it sounds great, sometimes it sounds rubbish, but mm -hmm. it's, it definitely gives it a unique swing. Of course. All right, so um, Nick, Mr. Beat Nick, Graham. Luckhurst. Grey Matter. Grey Matter. Thank you very much. Thank you.